right. Well, again, good morning, everybody. Hey, I just have a few announcements real quick, and then Landon has an announcement as well. But before we hear from Landon, i got to tell you guys just a few things really quick. So two weeks from today is our next downtown serving ministry time. So make sure to pray about that. We're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do that day. If you have any questions regarding that, you can see me after service, or you can see Ashley after service as well. And we'd love to uh, fill you guys in on some more details with that. Also, two weeks from today, we're going to have a very short meeting right after church. It was going to be today, but we decided to push it back to give more time to plan. So two weeks from today, right after service, we're going to have a, our small group me meeting about our small groups, our community groups. We're going to get some things figured out because we are growing. Things are changing. People are more and more interested in getting involved with our small groups, our community groups. So make sure to pray about that as well. Lenny, you come up and you can share with the church some things you had in your mind. We'll see what happens, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, well, you know, first of all, I want to say something about the community groups. If you're here and would like to get involved, we want to encourage you to please get involved with a uh, community group here. And uh, I, I was up here Wednesday night uh, doing, doing some work, and uh, uh, Jack and John's uh, group that they, they lead were meeting. And uh, I'll just say this. When we started uh, almost not hardly a year ago, um, literally the first night they met, guess who it was? It was just Jack and John <laughs> the first night. And when I walked back there this week, I couldn't believe the people and how God is blessed and how it has grown and uh, just really thank you guys for your faithfulness and the Lord's faithfulness and sending people it's been great so please get involved in a small group in a community group and uh, next we'll have this meeting in two weeks uh, Jonathan right raise your hand that's Jonathan uh, if you want to know about small groups community groups See Jonathan, he will get you connected to a group, all right? So do that, and hopefully for those of you, if you do get our, our uh, informational like messages, um, you saw this week we had a lot of people uh, volunteer a, a lot of new roles here at the church as we uh, continue to grow, and we're really excited about all of those people uh, taking on responsibility and, and caring for our church family. And so what we're going to do next week, right after church, um, we're going to have a bunch of, of finger foods, uh, refreshments. We want to introduce you. Uh, maybe you're new here and you don't know, right, who Ben is. Uh, we want you to know who Ben is and that he's married to Maria. And, uh, and we want you to know who Jonathan and, and so many others are, right? Uh, we want you to get to know them. And uh, you may be interested in serving uh, in a ministry that they're helping. So that's what that is for. And so next Sunday after church, We'll have some finger foods. I want you to get to know these folks, their families, and uh, see how you can help them and encourage them uh, in, in the ministry. So um, speaking of that, you're over what? Well, Landon has asked us for quite a while now for Marie and I to step up to be a student ministry director. So we've I've been praying about that for, for several months, and we have felt like God has given us the green light to do that. So we're prayerfully uh, going to be building a team together. I've already had a number of volunteers step up, said, that, hey, we want to serve. So we're going to serve together as a team uh, and focus on God, right, and see what we can do to serve our community for the students uh, from specifically. <laughs> well, that's all him. We're going to focus on, on you know, middle school and high school. We already have a number of those here at our church, and we have room to grow. Amen? Yeah. So we're excited to see what God's going to do through all that. So please, I just ask you guys to please pray. Pray for the whole team as we see what um, God is, you know, has in store for us for the community. And pray for Maria as she tries to help me, right? So, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you have any questions about serving in the student ministry, the children's ministry, any of the other opportunities in our church, please um, pray about that. Uh, anytime you can uh, reach out to me, I can help you get directives where you need to go. Again, reach out to Jonathan, um, any of the, the volunteers. So next week, like Landon said, right after church, we'll have a great time to get to meet and greet all those folks involved. So it's going to be great. I think that's all I had for us this morning. Then we're going to um, uh, pray, and then we'll have an awesome time of worship this morning. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for your love. God, thank you so much for your grace. God, thank you so much for your wisdom and discernment and all these things that you pour into our lives. God, we don't deserve it, but you give it to us anyway so freely, God, and we thank you for that. God, I just ask you to open up our hearts and our minds to be ready and willing to take in what you have for us this morning. And God, we just thank you so much for the visitors we have today. God, thank you so much for the ones that wanted to be here, but they just couldn't for whatever reason. We just ask you, God, to take care of them and wrap your arms around them. God, we just thank you so much for who you are 
And we just ask you, God, to move in a special way today. We want to be closer to you, God. Please help us to obtain that this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, let's worship together. Thank you all so much.
from the things that hold us back and we are his and he loves us so this morning let's praise him let's give him everything let's put it all out on the table that's all he wants he wants us just as we are
for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here in your presence. Be in your house, God. Just be with us. Pour your spirit out on us. And just be with the word today, God, that it would just fill us up and affect us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, good morning, everybody. Great to, uh, to be uh, in service and fellowship with you guys. Uh, thankful for our worship team and uh, all of our volunteers today. Uh, let's give everybody a big hand. Thankful for those serving in the back uh, in our kids' ministry as well. And uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, turn over to uh, the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel, we're going to be in chapter number 22, and um, we started a series last week called Before You Give Up, and uh, uh, here's what I would have to say today. I want you to know this. Um, You are welcomed here, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Thank goodness, right, that uh, the church is uh, one place, the one place where... um, Everybody can find a welcome. Everybody can find a home within the church of Jesus Christ. And um, so today, that's what we're going to look at. And uh, really, particularly some some individuals. And uh, maybe we relate a lot to those folks. I I believe we'll see some similarities. But uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 1, we're going to begin in verse number 1. And this is what the scripture says. And if you're here and you don't have your Bible with you, um, you can read along on the screen as well. So uh, this is what the Bible says. uh, 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 1. And David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And uh, let's just stop right there for a moment. Uh, Because we're only going to look at two verses today, but I want to give you a little bit of background about what is going on. Um, Really, this is a point where uh, David um, had been anointed to be the next king of Israel several years ago, right? He was a young man brought in before his family. The prophet Samuel anointed him, said, God has chosen you. You will be the next leader, the king uh, of Israel. And and from uh, your seed and your line, right, will uh, the world be blessed. And so um, ultimately, uh, years went on and we know about the story about David, right? And Goliath, how he came out and how he stepped in the fear, right? And in the spirit of the Lord, he went and he slew the giant Goliath. He became a national hero overnight. Everybody knew who David was. Uh, He was brought in to Saul's household, right? Saul wanted to keep him close. And so uh, more and more, David's fame began to grow. In fact, people would begin to sing, man, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And so over time, Saul, who knew that he uh, at some point would lose the kingdom, that God had chosen to give it to another man, uh, he did not know who that man was, but he soon began to realize it had to be David. And so a lot of anger, a lot of jealousy, a lot of animosity grew in Saul's heart. He wanted to do whatever he could to prevent this from happening. And so now we come to to this story here, and we're going to learn that, hey, David, it tells us he's, he's in a cave, in the cave of Adullam, and what he's doing there in this cave, right? You're a national hero. What are you doing in a cave? Well, he's hiding for his life. He's been running from King Saul. King Saul is trying to hunt him down. David has done nothing wrong. 
He's done nothing immoral, nothing worthy of what Saul wants to do to him. The fact is this, Saul is very jealous of David. He knows now this is the one. This is the one the Lord has chosen. And he knows that David will become the king of Israel unless Saul intervenes. And so you know what Saul wants to do? He wants to kill David. He wants to destroy him. He wants to do all he can to prevent him from ascending to Israel's throne. And in David's life at this moment and at this time when he finds himself in this cave on the run, literally every crutch that he may have had in life had been removed from him. And what I mean by that is simply this. His wife had betrayed him. His family had abandoned him. His best friend couldn't really do anything for him. It was Saul's son. And then his father-in-law, which guess what, is Saul, (laughs) wants to kill him. He has nobody to turn to. So he goes to this cave and he feels all alone, running for his life, fleeing, not knowing what to do next, nowhere to turn, what to do. And I think there's times in our lives, right, that we feel very much like David in those moments. We can get to a place where maybe we feel so isolated, so alone, so hurt, so maybe unappreciated, right, or unloved. And I'll tell you, at those moments in David's life, when he's there in the cave and he's all alone, not knowing what to do, you better believe that the enemy, right, that the devil, that Satan was there telling him all these things. Look, I know that God chose you. I know God anointed you. I know that they told you this, but look at you now and look where you're at. All these lies were being put into David's head. And, w- and listen, maybe you're here today and maybe there's times that you feel that way. You feel unappreciated. You feel unloved. You feel betrayed. You feel hurt. You, you feel all alone. I want you to know something. You've come to the right place because God loves you. He cares for you. You are not alone. You are valued. You are worth his son, Jesus, who gave his life on the cross. He gave it for you. Now, David was feeling down, really down at this point, going through all these trials, this adversity. You know, here's the great thing about the Lord. We realize as a follower of Christ, you begin to look around and you look back at the trials and the things you went through. You suddenly realize, you know what? God had a purpose in that. And that purpose, I didn't know it at the time. And maybe you're here and you're going through something uh, that, that you just can't even fathom that you would be in this place that you find yourself. Listen, God has hidden adversity, right? Or hidden purposes in the adversity that he allows to come into your life. And here David finds himself in this cave. He's all alone. One of the cool things about the word that's used here in the Bible, cave, it actually means a fortress. Uh, we might say that it's a fortified cave, right? It was a great spot, uh, a, a military Militarily speaking, okay? So he's there. He's got this huge fortress. God has led him here, but he's all alone. Here's one of the true things in life. Maybe you feel that you're in this way. Maybe you feel like you're in prison. Maybe you feel like you're in this fortified place you can't get out of. The prisons of our life often become great places of opportunity and ministry if we'll allow God to use them, all right? Over and over again, all through the Bible, we see men and women who went through great adversity great tribulations, great crises, and they allowed God to use them in that moment. And looking back, they seen that God had a great purpose and he used it for their good and for God's glory. And that's what he can do in your life today if you find yourself feeling in that very same manner. Here's the good news. David, he was all alone, yet God was with him. God was there with him in that cave. And David would emerge a different man from when he entered the cave some time later. Suddenly, we read here in verse 1 that as David's there, one day he looks up and all of a sudden his family comes to him. Did you see that? His brothers and all his father's house heard it. They went down there to him. David's family, they came to him. Think about this for a moment when we say his family. We mentioned it uh, earlier about when David was anointed king. They had all seen him. They were all in the room. They saw David be anointed by the prophet Samuel, right, to be uh, the next king of Israel one day. And um, we find that it was now that here they are. Years ago, they seen this happen. Now they're turning to David in this time of his trouble and in their time of trouble. We find his father who really uh, didn't even 
acknowledge David's existence when Samuel came. Samuel came and said, hey, where are your sons? Because God has chosen one to be king. And he called all of his sons except for David, <laughs> right? He's like, I can't be him. And so he had all of his others. So this was his father. He came now, right? He witnessed what Samuel did. He knew that now was the time to go to David. We see his brother, Elab, who when David had been anointed king right in front of his eyes, he was out still uh, shepherding his father's field. And Goliath came and Elab, right? He, his brother, his oldest brother, he was there in the army. He would not go out and face Goliath himself. And David came out and David couldn't believe no one would step forward. And Elab kind of in anger and in jealousy, he began to taunt David. So here we find there was some animosity between them, right? But here he comes seeing that David is in trouble and he goes to be with his brother. And this we know through scripture, his loyalty never waned. He believed, this tells you something about their family. They believed God's word. They believed what they had witnessed was true. And the second thing is this, that David lived a life worthy of their respect and their admiration. Let me ask them, how does your family view you? I thought about that as I read this story. David had to earn that admiration. He had to earn that respect from them. What from the life that he lived. They knew he loved the Lord. And they knew from just witness that, hey, what the Lord said he was going to do in his life, he's going to do it in his life. You know, Noah went to his family and said, listen, the Lord's told me he's going to destroy uh, the world and he wants us to build a boat. And you know what? His family believed him and they did that. Lot went to his family and said, the Lord has told me he's going to destroy the city. And they laughed at him. How do people betray us? How do they see us? David's family came to support and encourage him. And David later takes his father and his mother into a, a, another country, the country of Moab. That's where his grandmother Ruth was from. So his family came to him there. But that wasn't the only people that came to him. And that's what I want to get to the, the heart uh, of this today, what we're going to learn about. I want you to look at verse number two. After David hit basically rock bottom in his life, look what happens next. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. You know, David is described uh, in the Bible in Acts chapter 13, even Paul, he said this about him, as a man after God's own heart. He loved the Lord that much. He wanted to know God's heart and he sought it. And you know, when you live a life like that and you want to know the Lord and you seek his heart and you want to be like him, you know what happens? That attracts people. There's something about it, right? A magnetism that, that people see and they're like, man, there's something different about that person. I don't know what it is, but I'm curious about what it is. And I want that, right? And that is Jesus. And, and so here we find that David was a man who loved the Lord, who sought the Lord with all of his heart. And because of that, people were attracted to him. And uh, those who were attracted to him, did you notice how the Bible describes them? What a group, right? Everyone that's in distress, everyone that's in debt, everyone that's bitter in soul, they gathered to him. Now, if we were writing this story and we we're saying, hey, I want to gather an army, I want to gather a group of people, it would be quite opposite, right? We would pick the people that are easygoing. We'd pick people that are happy. We'd pick people that are wealthy, right? That's who we need to make an army. But it was quite the opposite that came to him. Those who were in distress, in debt, and discontent. They came to him. These were men, right, who were in affliction, tribulation, torment, some of them, hurt and anguish. And here's the thing, David, he, he didn't cause their pain, right? But he could relate to it. He knew what it was like. These people were unwanted. They were unloved. They were unlike. They were the outcast of Israel. And David, here they are, all gathering unto him. Isn't it amazing, right, in our lives where Satan comes along, and the devil comes along, and he tries to create blunderers, right, and botchers of all kinds of things. God goes on mission to redeem them. And that's what we see is happening right here. Every conflicting interest 
was represented in the men that came to David. It reminds us of the many people that came to Jesus. People came from every walks of life. Some for good reasons, others for not. Judas come for political and financial reasons. He came because he was taking money from the purse, right? Other people came and they're like, hey, I'm kind of curious about this. I want to know about this Jesus guy. And one day when Jesus told them, hey, if you're going to follow me, it takes a commitment. It takes you being able to, to take your cross, to deny what you want in your life and your plan for your life and realize I've got something better than you could ever imagine for your life. And I want you to come and be willing to take up your cross and carry it daily. And the Bible tells us when people heard this, that many people turned and followed Jesus no more but there were some who were sincere in following Jesus they believed him to be exactly who he said he was and what they found in their life was forgiveness and meaning and love and value and worth and purpose and that's what Christ can give us today it was what they're searching for it's what every heart longs for and it can only be found in Jesus Christ now these men they came to David from all areas of life, the outcast of culture. And that's what Jesus specializes in, taking people like you and me and taking people who the world might say they're outcasts. And you know what he does? He turns us into the children of God, into the people of God. You see, that's all of our story today. We could say that we could came to Jesus when we were distressed, when we were in debt, when we were discontent. We came looking for something greater than what this world had to offer us. And that's what these men did as well. They came to David, and at the end of the day, there was about 400 of them, and they came. And I, I thought it was amazing because, you know, you look at this, and I read this, and I'm like, what a mess. But yet God looked at this and says, you know what? I don't see a mess. I see the message in it. When we look at our lives, right? I mean, this is like Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader, right? Saul's the king. Uh, he's got a vast army. And this ragtag group of men are coming together. It's kind of like George Washington and the Continental Army going against King George and the British Empire. These men keep coming with all their problems, with all their mess. And David's like, hey, you know what? You have nowhere else to go. You're welcomed here. Isn't that a great message? You have nowhere to turn. You have nowhere to go. No one will claim you. No one will say, hey, I, that, that's my family. That's my dad. Uh, that's my brother. That's my son. That's my daughter. You have nowhere else to go when they've all been. You are welcome here. Come on. That's the church of Jesus today. That's the church. It's amazing because we read over in the Psalms that David was writing his prayers. He was writing these Psalms in this moment of his life and during this time. And all this ragtag army that he's got and all these men with all their problems and everything. David prays one night and David says this in Psalms 57. Look at this. He says, my soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. I, I thought that was interesting. My soul is in the midst of lions. Because wait a minute, I I just read that these men were in distress, they were in debt, and they were discontent. And yet David lays down at night and he prays to the Lord. He said, Lord, I feel like I'm in the midst of some lines. In other words, he was able to look down and say, you know what? I, I see beyond the discontent. I see beyond the distress in their life. I see beyond the debt. And I see there's a lion deep down inside of those men. And there's a reason that you've sent them here. There's a reason that they're with me. Because under David's leadership, they became an effective fighting force. It's actually been proposed that there was a group of mercenaries that were called the Lebates. And they actually had a lioness as their symbol, right? That may have been exactly what David was talking about. He's like, hey, I lay in the midst of lions, and I realize that. Aren't you glad? Like, look, David didn't see them for what the world see them. He didn't see them that way. He saw something greater in them. And he wanted to introduce them to the Lord so that the Lord could pull it out of them. God sees us for not what we are, but he sees us for what we can become. And so many people, right, we, we, we see a zero and yet God sees a hero. 
And God was turning this group of, of discontented, distressed, and in-debt people into David's mighty men of valor. The first time you're introduced to these men is right here. And the Bible describes them as what? Discontented, distressed, a bunch of in-debt men. And then later we're going to learn the Bible goes in to specifics about these men and the great acts they accomplish in his name. Because that's what God can do. If a heart is willing and a person comes and they come to Christ and they say, here I am with all my distress, with all my discontent, with all my debt. I give it all to you, God. What can you do? God can take that heart and he can make a world changer out of that person. And that may be you today. You may be here and you may feel that way. Listen, God is speaking to you and letting you know he believes in you. He loves you. He died for you. And most importantly, he can help you today if you're willing to come to him. God's not afraid of our failures as we learned last week. He embraces them. He redeems them. He looks at us and he gives us grace. You know what grace is? It's the ability to see beyond what we are, right? And that's what David's seen in these men. He, he gave them grace. He said, hey, if you're willing, and if you're willing to get your heart right, if you're willing to live right, then we can work together. And all God needs is a willing heart. And if you're willing to come and give him your heart and your life and say, here I am, take me as I am, mold me, change me, make me like you, he can do a wonderful work in your life. I believe in that cave where David once found himself all alone and with a bunch of men that many of us would say that sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. We find there was actually real love, real unity, and real blessing that was in that cave. And listen, that is what is to be found in the church of Jesus Christ. If there's any place in the world where you should be able to walk into and find real love and real unity and a kindness one for another and a forgiveness and mercy and grace, it is the church of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, if you can't find it here, you'll never find it anywhere else in this world. It's where it's supposed to be. These men came to David. They were willing to be changed. And he loved them and he took them in. And God was going to make them into a great army. Now, I want to talk about this because I think really we relate to this. Notice the first thing that described them said they were people who were distressed. You know what that means? That means people who are under pressure. It means they're stressed out. Now, I doubt that sounds like any of us, but um, right? <laughs> Anybody in here ever stressed out 30 times a day, Right? Come over to my house. The stress, it's a state of, of the body, the mind, right? It changes us. And people who were coming to David, they had afflictions, tribulations. They were stressed out. They were hurt. They were anguished. And again, as we said earlier, he, he didn't cause their pain, but guess what? He could relate. He knew what it was like. Here's what I want you to know today, that we serve a Savior, Jesus Christ, who the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this, for we don't have some high priest, right, who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. What I love about this is Jesus is able to sympathize with your weakness. Listen, the... There's people that are here today and I'm going to go through something in life and something's going to happen and you're not going to be able to relate. The same things with me. You're going to go through something and I, and I can pray with you and I can encourage you, but, I, but I've not been there. I've not felt that hurt. I've not felt that anguish. Listen, we're serving a Savior that says in everything you've went through and all the weaknesses you experience in life, I want you to know I feel your pain. I've been there. I've walked in your shoes and you can come to me and you can find help and grace and strength when you need it the most. When we're in distress, we can come to Christ. There was a lady in the gospel, and she was certainly under distress. She didn't have a monthly cycle, she had a daily cycle. And because of that, it caused her great shame. She was away from her family, isolated, because of her condition. She had spent everything she had on doctors. Nothing could help. There was no answers. And she heard that Jesus was coming through one day over her town. And she said in her mind, you know, I believe if I can get to this man, he can help me. 
And so here she is, imagine for 12 years, she's had continually loss of blood every day. And she makes her way through this massive crowd that's gathered around Jesus. And she presses through the crowd and she goes and she gets the hem of his garment. And immediately Jesus knows somebody in faith has reached out. Somebody has got to the throne room of heaven and somebody just experienced God's power in their life. And he stops and he turns around and he asks, who touched me? You know, and the disciples like, what do you mean? Everybody's touching you. He's like, no, 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 no. Someone just touched me. Someone's life just got changed. And this lady who has been in shame in hiding in isolation for the last 12 years of her life. She comes and she falls down before him and she says, it's me. And Jesus looks at her and he says, daughter, go your way. You are made whole. Not only did Jesus heal her in that moment, but listen, Jesus changed everything about her life. Her isolation, it was removed. Her shame was removed. He gave her a new name. He called her daughter, right? Like he didn't know her, yet now he knows her. He says, daughter, you're one of the family. And that's the great thing about Jesus. Today, you may feel all alone and isolated. Maybe your family has disowned you or you've disowned them. When you come to Jesus today, you can have a new family. You can be a part of a new community. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Today, you can have a new identity, a new family, a new community to belong to and to know, and to love, and to cherish. Why did we come to Jesus? Because we were in distress. You know, people don't come to Jesus when things are great. They don't come to Jesus in the good times. Most often, it's when times of crisis. It's when emergencies hit. It's when we are distressed. And hey, maybe it's not of this world. Maybe it's a time you realize, you know what? I don't have a relationship with God. Oh, this thing about death, this thing about hell, that's real. Oh, no, you know, hey, that's distress. I was nine years old, and I remember the first time I realized, "Uh uh-oh, this is real, and I don't know Christ, and he's just speaking to me, and I know I need to do something. In that moment at nine years old, I was sweating. I was in great distress because I realized I was lost, and I didn't want to stay that way. I wanted to be found, and I came to Christ. And he accepted me just like I am. I don't remember what I said. I just, only thing I can remember is I said, Jesus, I love you. I know you died for me on the cross and I'm a sinner and please forgive me. And guess what? That was enough. And it's enough for you if you're willing to come. He can make you new. He can take away the distress. Now, a lot of people say, oh man, you don't want to. What do you mean you're turning to Jesus in those moments, in those trials? That's weak. Those people aren't weak. Those people are smart. (laughs) People are smart that come to Jesus. Listen, the prodigal son, when he hit rock bottom, when he came to the end of himself, he found the beginning of God. And you could do that today as well. People that are in stress. What about this? People that are in debt. These were people that owned a lot of money to creditors, but not just to creditors. To, to, they had made some bad financial decisions. They didn't, weren't just running from, hey, paying their bills. They were running because in this time, if you didn't pay your bills, they weren't coming to repossess your car. They weren't coming to take your home. They were coming to take you. <laughs> you were going to work for them until you paid your debt off. These were men on the run, right? They were in debt and they came. Anybody here ever made a bad financial decision? Didn't think so, right? As my buddy Dave Ramsey says, fortunately, stupid isn't illegal, right? We've all been there. Uh, I I read this week, just to say this, a Gallup survey. The average number of of credit cards owned by Americans is 2.6. Debt's not just an American problem. Let me tell you this, it is a heart problem. The thing I, I, I find about... You know, these men, they weren't content to live within their means. A wise person once said, we, what we need is not treasure, but to be treasured by the one who created us. These men sought to change their life. Had they made bad decisions? Yes, they had. Had they made mistakes? Yes, they had. 
But what these men did was they sought to change their life. And today, if you're here, and, and whether it's in physical debt you find yourself in, I would ask you to seek God's wisdom that is found in His Word regarding your personal finances. Don't let that be your story. Because when you seek God and you seek to understand about how, how, how to manage that in your life, and guess what? God cares about how you manage that in your life. You will see a great change in how you view money. There's over 2,000, get the 2,000 conversations in the Bible about money and possessions. In fact, Jesus talked about money more than heaven and hell combined. And you might think, why in the world uh, would he do that? Or you might say, oh, I knew the church was about money. No, 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 no. The reason that Jesus talked about it so much is because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. And he did not say, you can't serve God and the devil. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you cannot serve God and, and be sinful. He didn't say that. He said, you cannot serve God and money. Understand today that the number one competitor for your heart and my heart, it's money. And so Jesus spoke about it very often because he cares about how we view money. These men that came were in debt. It's a beautiful picture of them coming to David and then you and I coming to Christ. Because here's the truth today. The Bible tells us that all of us are in spiritual debt. Did you know that? Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says this. It says, The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our wages is sin. And that sin builds up and builds up and accumulates debt. And guess what? You and I, according to the Bible, we have no way to pay that off. All of us that are here, we're in debt to God. Our sin has created a huge debt that we cannot pay. As we said a couple of weeks ago, Jesus paid a debt he didn't know. Because we owe a debt we cannot pay. On the cross, one of Jesus' last words, he cried out, he said, It is finished. You think, well, that's a weird thing to say, right? A man that's dying on the cross, he cries out, It is finished. What does that mean? What's amazing, that's an accounting term. And what we find was like history records, there's tons and tons of documents from Jesus' time. That when a man owed a person a debt, when he owed a lender, when he finally repaid that debt, they wrote on it, it is finished. When Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, he was saying that your debt and my debt that we owe God has now once and for all totally been paid for, totally wiped off, not forgiven, not let go, not written off, paid for. There's a huge difference in that, right? There's a huge difference in filing bankruptcy and saying, I can't pay for it and I got to move on. And, and then somebody walking into the bank and writing a check that you have no ability to write and paying it off and saying they're forgiven, no record, paid in full. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's what he did. He paid for it. Somebody had to pay. Jesus said, I did that. I did that for you. Because I love you. Distressed, in debt, and then what? Discontent. People who've been wrong, mistreated. Said they were bitter in soul. Harsh, resentful, cold, relentless, unpleasant to be around. That was the group that came in to join David. Discontentment keeps us from being the person God wants us to be. The Bible tells us God wants us to live in joy, in love, and in peace not, not in bitterness. And God, through His grace and mercy, was able to change their hearts and He can change your heart. Discontent. Listen, you can have everything in this world that it offers and you can still find yourself empty at the end of the day. Because the world can't fill up that place. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, when he's talking to them about what true contentment is. This is what he said. He said, hey, not that I'm speaking of being in need, but I've learned this. In whatever situation I am, to be content. I think that's awesome. He says, I have learned. 
didn't say I was born this way or I manage. I've learned. And let that be our story, that we have learned to be content in this life, in Christ. Paul said, whether I have a meal tonight or I don't, I've learned to be content with it and understand God has a purpose for it. Whether I have clothes or I don't, I'm going to be content. Whether I've got a place to sleep tonight or I don't, I will be content in him. Listen, if being content means that everything has to be easy, that our self-worth, that our meaning, that our faith depends on our idea of happiness, we'll never find contentment on this side of eternity. True contentment is found in one place, and that place is actually a person, and it's Jesus Christ. And today, if you need contentment, if you're searching for joy and love and true happiness, it can only be found in a relationship with Jesus. And as these men came who were outcast of the culture and society, as they made their way to David, through the Lord's help, they became great men of valor. Today, Jesus is calling you to come as people for millennia have come and come to him and come to the cross and say, Lord, here's my heart. Here's all my discontentment. Take all my distress. Take all my debt. I can't pay it, Lord. But you paid it for me. And if we come and give it to him, he can change us. He can make us new. He can bring us into a new family, a new community. And guess what? That couldn't just be their story. Today, that can be your story. Your story. So what king do you choose today? Saul? Or David? Jesus? Or Satan? This is the great thing about life. You choose who your king will be. All of us. You make the choice. We make choices every day. And sometimes those choices are right. Other times those choices are wrong. There's an old saying that says, you make your choices and your choices make you. Today I'm going to ask you to make a choice. You can continue on in distress, discontentment, in debt to God. Or today you can make a decision to change your life for eternity. And to bring all that junk, all that mess, and come and give it to Jesus and watch him do something wonderful with it. I'm going to ask our worship team to come. Everybody stand. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and just the reminders we have in your word, Lord, not just in the New Testament, but Lord, how you were working in the Old Testament. You've been working in men's and women's hearts, Lord, since Adam and Eve was created. And Lord, I know you want to do a work in people's hearts today, in the right here, in the right now. And Lord, I pray that you would just find those people, Lord, right now that you know, or they feel all alone, they feel isolated, maybe betrayed and hurt, or they're in anguish. Maybe they're under just an, a tremendous amount of pressure, Lord. Let them know they can come to you and bring it to you and lay it down and leave it and walk away a new person, change from the inside out. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We ask it in your name. And amen. Hey, this is time is for you. If you're here and you want to come and pray, you're going through something, you need somebody to pray with you, grab somebody, come. We'll meet you here. If you're here and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, just come on right now. We'll meet you right here. We pray that you would just grab a friend and invite a friend next week and come and experience this once again. We love you. This time is to worship and for prayer. Use it this morning.
love for him There will be a day Death will be no more Standing face to face Hear that he rums again Holy, holy is the Lord Every prayer Songs of faith We sang through doubt and fear And in the end We see that it was worth it When He turns To wipe away our tears There will be a day And all will bow before Him Stand beside the heroes of the faith With one voice, a thousand generations Sing worthy is the man who was saved And on that day, we join the resurrection Lord, we thank you once again for allowing us to be here today, God. We just thank you that you've made a way for us to get back to you through Jesus Christ. And that we can show that love to everybody else through your church, God. And we just thank you that there's a place we can come even though we're broken, even though we're messed up, even though we don't deserve to stand before you. But God, you made us a family and you made us a way back to you, God. We love you so much. Be with us as we go our separate ways. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you all. Have a great week.